Um, so at this time, what I'd like to do before we get started on the content of our first panel is just introduce um, everyone who's here with us today. Um, it would take too long to go through their full um, bios. Um, so I am just going to actually sort of identify them and, and a quick descriptor. Um, but I encourage you uh, to take a look at the Corporate Crime Observatory website that Costa mentioned and has also uh, provided the link in the chat. Uh, and there you'll find a fuller description of everyone who's with us today. And um, I'll just say, I want to thank them at the outset because the heart of this kind of uh, round table is really um, the input, the ideas, the thoughts um, that our uh, panelists um, bring to us. And I very much appreciate them devoting uh, this time to us today. So just briefly and in alphabetical order, we have with us today, Paul Applin, a tax technology specialist. Philippa Anzalone, she's Associate Dean for Library at Boston College Law School. Meredith Barges, Policy Analyst and Interfaith Chaplain. Dawn Carpenter, Director of the Solidarity Economic Ec Economy Workshop at Georgetown University. Samantha Feinstein, Staff Attorney and Director of the Government Accountability Project. Paul Fiorelli, uh, Professor of Business Law and Accountancy at Xavier University. Susan Fortney, Professor of Law Texas A&M University School of Law, Maria Amparo Grau Ruiz, Professor of Tax Law at Complutense University of Madrid, Mary Inman, Attorney and Partner at Constantine Cannon LLP in San Francisco, Daniele Majorana, Majorana International Tax Advisor, uh, Eli Moskowitz, Investigative Journalist at the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, uh, Sadesh Rao, a PhD Researcher and in Institute for Austrian and International Tax Law, Michael Ronecker, attorney and partner at Constantine Cannon LLP in DC. Christopher Sykes, senior lecturer, Manchester Law School. Marie Terracol, whistleblower protection lead at Transparency International. And Carla Vigian, principal of International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants. So uh, a fantastic and really uh, quite varied group. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to all that they bring to us today. So uh, to start us on our first panel, uh, the title, Transparency and Whistleblowing. And in this part of our session today, uh, we're really going to try to delve into um, the degree and or lack of transparency surrounding uh, tax professionals practices. Um, and what we're trying to do is highlight the impact of, for example, things like notable leaks like the Panama Papers in uncovering instances of tax abuse. We also want to be thinking about uh, the ethical dilemma faced by tax professionals in reporting illegal activities um, and the broader implications of exposing ethically questionable practices. Uh, and really think about the factors that contribute to figuring out when it's in the public interest, um, the uncovered tax abuses become examined, uh, and also think about the role of uh, transparent beneficial owner registers in preventing malpractice. Um, so those are kind of a, a range of the issues and themes we'll be looking at in this first session. Um, and so to get us started, I thought I would uh, begin with a somewhat broad question, but one that I think gives us a chance to uh, start thinking about these issues. And so, uh, you know, as you look back over the past 15 or 20 years, I'd say, uh, transparency has become increasingly uh, a focus of attention in efforts to uh, combat conduct that is uh, not desired, whether on the financial side or the tax side. Um, and so I think the question I'd like to sort of raise for you all is, is what is the role? Why might it be important, perhaps crucial, to have transparency with respect to financial flows? And to kind of bring it into the specifics of our, our overall panel, uh, in ses session today, uh, how can the lack of transparency be exploited by tax professionals in the gray area? So I just kind of open that up to sort of initial thoughts that any of you might want to kind of put forward for us. You know, just raise your, your sort of uh, Zoom hand and I will turn to you. James. Hi, uh, good afternoon or oh, good morning. Well, good evening. Um, so uh, transparency on financial flows, uh, I find interesting what you might mean by that. Um, because you've got private uh, financial flows, 
uh, and you've got commercial financial flows. The latter are commercially sensitive um, and there have been initiatives uh, in some countries to um, force the publication of corporate tax returns, which is highly commercially sensitive information is great for competitors. So as someone who advises businesses and individuals, um, when I hear uh, transparency on financial flows, what I hear is sensitive information being handed to um, competitors to undermine the business model. If I want to, uh, if if I want to get ahead in business, I want to find out the profit margin of my competitors, what their costs are, what their revenues are, so I can try and beat them. Uh, as far as private clients are concerned, um, in the UK, uh, cybercrime is now the single largest threat to citizens. You're more much more likely to be robbed online than you are in the street. Um, and, and therefore, private data, um, which is another word for financial flows, uh, it is something that is, is of real concern. Uh, so my, my position, and probably not shared by most of the people on the panel, but I'm used to being unpopular, um, <laughs> it, it, it is, is that we need to be careful, right? Um, two wrongs do not make a right. Uh, financial, financial crime is wrong. But financial crime, all financial crime is wrong. And there's actually far more cyber crime than there is tax evasion uh, going on. Um, and, and that's a reality in the UK. I can't speak for the US. I haven't looked at the figures. So um, I'd be interested in narrowing down what you mean by uh, um, transparency on financial flows. Because, of course, with CRS and FATCA, um, there isn't any secrecy anymore as far as... Um, what is held by who uh, between governments. There is still, and it's probably where you're going to get on to, uh, privacy uh, when it comes to what the public can access. So that, that's why I think that the debate bifurcates is those adherents of governmental um, swapping of information, which I'm, I'm a supporter of, uh, versus those that love the idea of it all being splashed on the internet so the public can dip in. Uh, I'm definitely uh, not in that camp. Over to you. So, uh, yeah, I certainly, um, oh, I think if you could, there we go. Uh, intentionally broad, um, I think it's important for us to be drawing out and thinking through uh, different kinds of parties, as you said, commercial and private flows, um, but also the scale of options that we have before us. So to the extent we're thinking about transparency, it is not an on off switch. And one can you know, consider a wide range of options. Um, so I really think that I intended it to be quite broad. And I'd love to hear if others have some sort of uh, initial reactions to that. Um, I, in my mind, I will say I also was thinking a little bit, um, we'll talk later about this as well, but beneficial ownership certainly uh, pops into this. Uh, but Samantha, I will turn to you. Thanks, Diane. Um, so you know, I think that there's sort of two ways of transparency. There's uh, proactive disclosures of information that are, are made public to people, um, or at least uh, available to, to governments or exchanged uh, internationally. And then there's there's whistleblowers who take something that's non-public and not proactively disclosed because they found wrongdoing. And we've seen that you know in professions like accountants and the legal profession, there's necessarily a duty of loyalty, both to your employer and especially to your clients. And there is a need to operate with, with some level of, of privacy and, and, and there's natural uh, privacy rights that attach to um, many records. But when whistleblowers like the LuxLeaks whistleblowers, which I think we'll get into more soon, and, and the Panama Papers whistleblowers have uh, made disclosures uh, it has been at their peril, but we've seen that there's been public outrage. Uh, we've seen this spark uh, policy changes and investigations and improvements in transparency and accountability. Um, and the level of, of tax evasion um, and, and abuses of these gray areas has really been alarming and very, very harmful 
to uh, taxpayers, not just from wealthy countries, um, but from not wealthy countries. And so it has been something where having whistleblowers who sh shed sunlight on these issues has helped to change these practices. But it's clear we're still a long way from, from where we need to be if we want to be in a place where um, it is more difficult for um, companies to exploit these gray areas, but especially uh, where it is more difficult for companies to so easily retaliate against whistleblowers by pro prosecuting them criminally uh, and civilly that leads to litigation, which even when whistleblowers win, and we'll get into this more soon, but even when they win, it really doesn't look like like winning. Um, they've often lost their careers and, and the remedies are still really horrible um, and the laws in place are not where they need to be. So I'll have more to say on that quite soon, but that's, that's for now. Thanks, Dan. Anyone else want to sort of offer any initial thoughts at this point? One thing I was going to mention, sort of, I was thinking about the connection, Samantha, between what you said and James. Um, you know, it uh, it is really sort of, the, at least from a, a U.S. perspective and tracking the history, it was the whistleblower um, unfolding in 2008, 2009, 2010 that, in fact, did lead to FATCA. Um, and so you would never have seen that, but for, we were not on that path. Um, some people may have had interest in it, but we were certainly not on that path, but for. Um, but that isn't the same thing necessarily as uh, to use identified proactive um, specific uh, structures going forward. Um, well, actually, I thought, you know, since you sort of led us to this, I thought maybe I would turn to that kind of um, and, and just put it out there a little bit more as a question. Um, you know, what are the ways in which leaks such as Panama Papers um, help define the gray areas of tax abuse, um, help us sort of see them um, and maybe articulate what it is we're worried about, what we should be looking at, and how do, how do those leaks um, enhance awarenesses of practices? Um, you know, you gave us some examples. I was wondering if others have some thoughts on sort of ways in which they've seen uh, the leaks play out and, and shape our understanding of the gray space. you all chance to ponder that. Well, uh, maybe just to add, maybe this isn't something not related to tax, but this is an outcome of what Panama Papers, when the leaks came out, uh, I think this was also discussed in the last discussion. And when the leaks were out, while defending the case in the court, the lawyers of of the of the papers which were leaked, the, cli the clients, they actually, uh, what they did was um, uh, the the issue of privilege, of uh, of of claiming the privilege over the over the documents which were leaked, and um, uh, there was this issue of whether a whether it was a genuine uh, use of privilege or not, or whether privilege can be used in the circumstances where that information where it's 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 a gray area for tax avoidance and it was an issue which 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 gen generally which was which came out of the, of the panama papers so i think this is something which is crucial for also for the for the today's discussion thank you yes um marie and then paul and then james marie i can't hear you Can anyone else hear Marie? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, no, I, I was saying that the the information that we we have on the workings of the offshore worlds and those abuse of corporate structure for so for the purpose of tax evasion, but also corp corruption, which is what Transparency International is more uh, looking at. And well, they all come from those large scale leaks, right? Like the, the Panama Papers, but quite a few others. And uh, and I, and well, since like the and most of those main transparency standards that we have in place now, even though we have a long way to go, uh, they have been the consequences of those 
like the public pressures that was prompted by by these leaks um and uh, considering that there was uh you know, no systemic way to have a sense of the scale of abuse, right? Before we we actually, that was quite a bit of a shock for a lot of people uh, when that came out. So so from that perspective, we really have to say thank you to whistleblowers for, for the progress we achieved uh, in terms of transparency. Um, but at the same time, maybe that's something we'll go into it a bit later. It's, I mean, it's still a long way to go and it means we are still gonna have to rely on whistleblowers to actually get this information and uh, which is like also putting a lot of weight on on the on the shoulders of those whistleblowers who as uh, Sam mentioned earlier they actually usually suffer severe consequences from from coming out and like speaking up thank you thank you uh Paul and then James yeah you know, whatever I think of whistleblowers I think of two of their biggest fears. One is retaliation and the other one is managerial inaction. And I was impressed when I read the article, I think you uh, you had sent to us about uh, uh, the Panama Papers about the whistleblower who was located in, in Germany. And he or she, because we don't know the gender or the identity of the person, uh, still lives in fear. It lives in fear of, uh, of uh, bodily harm, uh, not getting uh, not, not getting any kind of compensation from uh, the German government, not living up to promises. So uh, again, for me, that was an interesting example of, of really some of the big fears that uh, that these whistleblowers have. Um, in addition to the Panama Papers, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, with LuxLeaks, and just in February of this year, um, Raphael Halle was uh, he had his conviction uh, overturned by the European Court of Human Rights. And originally he had been, he was a, uh, a, a, a an employee of PwC and basically uh, turned over information to uh, a consortium of international reporters uh, or journalists about these the, these tax schemes that were going on in uh, in Luxembourg. And in 2016, Luxembourg basically uh, prosecuted him and he was subject to a nine month fine or a nine month uh, sentence suspended and a thousand dollar fine. That was affirmed back in 2021. Uh, uh, but just in, uh, in February of this year, the, the uh, European Court of uh, Human Rights basically said this. Thus, after weighing up all the interest concerned and taking account of the nature, severity and chilling effect of the applicant's criminal conviction, the court concluded that the interference with the right to freedom of expression, in particular, his freedom to impart information had not uh, had not been necessary in a democratic society. So they were basically weighing uh, the disclosure of information versus uh, the privacy protecting uh, protected rights of the of the client. So I found that case very, very interesting in addition to uh, the Panama Papers. Thank you very much. Um, uh, James. Yeah, uh, uh, Panama Papers is some uh, something I know quite a lot about um, because there's a big story here in the UK and I was uh, on the media quite a lot talking about the consequences of it. Um, uh, let's just get things straight. Firstly, the Panama Papers was a huge theft of private information um, and the person that stole it made a lot of money from that. They may have had some legal difficulties afterwards, but I'm aware of the sums that were involved. Theft of private information is a crime. So by, by just giving a blanket congratulations and, and, and um, everything for so-called whistleblowers uh, w without discrimination means that you're encouraging crime. I had clients that were caught up in Panama Papers, um, and, and, and it is um, a lazy um, stereotype to suggest that anyone that has a Panamanian company is engaged in tax evasion. All of my clients were uh, highly compliant. And the reason they used Panamanian companies uh, was because they're cheap, uh, not, not because of the lack of tax. There are lots of um, countries you can go to for that. And most people that comment on this actually don't understand the workings of the tax system. Fortunately, we have some academics uh, on the panel that do, uh, that will tell you that just having a Panamanian company doesn't mean you don't pay any tax because you have to make the money somewhere and wherever you make it normally imposes withholding taxes. 
Um, uh, and then when you extract the money, uh, there will be a dividend tax in your home country. So it, it, it is unfortunately a lazy stereotype that everyone caught up in it. Uh, a, a number of my clients were caught up uh, and, and their tax affairs were fully up to date. Every single penny that was properly due to the tax authorities was paid. But as a consequence of this theft of data, they were debanked by their banks because banks run a million miles from any kind of controversy these days. Um, on, 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 finally, on the question of legal privilege, of, of course, legal privilege applies to all um, uh, uh, legal advice given uh, and to documents. It's a cornerstone of our democracy. Um, if you cannot rely on a private channel of communication with your lawyer, then we don't really, we, we live in a totalitarian state. Um, so, so we have to be careful. Um, my, my opinion remains um, that more will be done uh, from intergovernmental uh, cooperation. And, and I'm sorry, it wasn't whistleblowers that's led to all this transparency. This was something that was started by OECD uh, and the EU a long time ago with the first anti-money anti laundering directive. The Panama Papers pushed it along quickly. I agree with that. But there was already international cooperation years ago on that before Panama Papers came out. Yeah, I'll just intervene on that. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, after the failed um, effort in 1998 to have tax competition as a path forward, um, there was a shift to information exchange. Uh, my point was, though, in the U.S., it was going nowhere, really, um, until you had. So to think about um, FATCA, that was what moved uh, Congress. And so, um, yes, absolutely, the idea was out there and it, it you know, um, had had elements to build on, um, so that's quite crucial. Um, so I wanted to, uh, Samantha turn to you next. Yes. So, so much to 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 say and unpack here. Uh, but I guess I'll start just by saying that I mean the OECD, the European Union, um, uh, which opened up investigations of the Parliament and the Commission. Um, uh, they all they all credited. Uh, you know, whistleblowers uh, via these scandals uh, with uh, galvanizing these reforms that they themselves uh, have uh, uh, produced in response to these scandals. I think it's obvious that the public really doesn't have the stomach or, or tolerance um, in, in a democratic society to be seeing, um, you know, big companies um, and, you uh, uh, wealthy individuals be able to manipulate complex financial structures to exploit um, these gaps and, and it deprives the governance of, of revenue and it really erodes uh, public trust in the system. Uh, and so, you know, I think that the, these scandals show that the status quo um, really can't uh, be maintained. Um, I do think that you know, these scandals, LuxLeaks, Panama Papers, um, uh, SwiftLeaks, I think even were cited in the proposal for the EU Whistleblower Protection Directive, uh, which does give better protections for whistleblowers. But I think more importantly, it requires companies with 50 or more employees to have internal whistleblowing systems and, and anti-retaliation policies in place. And I think that is a great step in the right direction. I know we're going to talk a little bit more um, later about some of the, the international standards um, that protect uh, accountants who, who wish to who find something illegal and how to deal with that internally so you don't even have to go in externally. And that, of course, protects the interests of the, the company uh, and the client in terms of privacy. Uh, there are circumstances, um, perhaps you know, limited, um, but extreme, you know, circumstances uh, that would, in the public interest, necessitate making an external disclosure to the lawful authorities that are are, are available to them. So there are ways to, to report things, but I do want to get a little bit into LuxLeaks in particular, just to shed light that, um, uh, you know, since then, Luxembourg changed its related practices. Um, the EU looked into um, uh, an exchange of the advance uh, tax agreement, um, and the inquiries were opened up at the European Parliament. The European Commission had proceedings, um, and rules were introduced that require companies uh, to disclose their tax payments and profits on a country by country basis. And the OECD established a uniform definition of tax basis. So there's a lot, there's a lot of, of, of 
positive developments that happened as, as a light in light of this. But I, I still, you know, take issue with uh, what happened in the case of Raphael Hallett at the um, uh, European uh, Human Rights Court, which posed this really overly vague balancing test between the employer's interests um, and the public interest where, you know, the whistleblower really has to approve, uh, I'm sorry, prove that um, their disclosures were essential, new, previously unknown information, um, and whether they were necessary in a democratic society. And they have to convincingly establish that. And, um, you know, there are some circumstances where the employer should suffer detrimental effects if they have been uh, responsible for uh, serious financial misconduct on a large international scale. Uh, and so this is a really messy balancing test for whistleblowers to navigate. They really can't rely on their rights until there's, you know, a messy, thorough, um, litigation on the matter. And here we're talking about someone who was you know, prosecuted uh, criminally and, and civilly, but we see that this is a strong public interest uh, uh, whistleblowing disclosure, um, which was proven, which is why he won. But I also want to talk about that because, you know, he only got 15,000 euros um, in non-pecuniary damages. Um, and he had claimed um, 75,000 euros uh, in attorney's fees and costs um, related to the litigation. Um, and he was only granted 40,000. Uh, so you do the math. He got a bill at the end. He didn't get a, a reward. Um, this was not a, um, a money-making uh, endeavor. So, I, I mean, I, I do think that... Uh, whistleblowers, and this is not the only case study, I have more for you later, uh, many more, where whistleblowers have gone to jail, or they've been fined, or they've had, um, uh, you know, multiple uh, court litigations. Um, and uh, I really think that if we want to have more accountability, we really need greater whistleblower protections. And I would like to see more progress in terms of advancements and in internal um, disclosure channels. And I think that could make a big difference for whistleblowers and companies alike. So um, I'm, I'm just going to kind of shift us a little bit because we're going to come around to some more on the whistleblowing. I just um, wanted to draw two points um, here. Uh, and I think they, they connect a couple of things that several of you said. One is, as we were seeing, what are some of the problems um, that in part are embedded in the activities of tax professionals that may be problematic and may come out through reporting. Uh, we have some that are tax per se, um, some that might be corruption, but not tax. So you could be hiding things um, not from taxes, but really, you know, in terms of the, the corrupt path by which you've come to possess um, those funds. Uh, and then related issues about, say, holders of public office, for example, who are, aren't um, uh, fully disclosing what they have. So it doesn't, and I think it's quite right to say it's not always a tax issue. There are multiple things going on, including things that uh, fall into none of those baskets, um, as was identified. Um, the other thing I just wanted to sort of kind of get you to start thinking about is the ways in which uh, we've already not necessarily lined up, but seen multiple levels and ways of imagining transparency. It can be through technology, which can make it transparent to future auditors. Really, our case study showed that, or to the government pretty easily. It can be transparency in the sense of proactive directive reporting. It can be transparency that could be to the government with some ability to have a broader disclosure, uh, not necessarily fully to the public, but something broader. Um, and then one could imagine truly public, you open up a website and there it is. So I just kind of, there are multiple pieces. We talked a little bit about that. I just wanted to lay it out. But we have limited time and so much to cover. So I want to bring us to uh, a slightly um, uh, related question, which is something someone actually mentioned a little bit. Um, think about the tax professionals themselves. Um, how can they be directly involved in disclosing either sort of illegal or unethical conduct? Um, for example, tax advisors reporting clients' misconduct uh, 
or another possibility is safeguarding tax whistleblowers. But I think I'll start stay for the moment with uh, tax advisors reporting client misconduct. Sort of what is that space as you see it uh, for tax professionals? Uh, you know, uh, when is that going to happen? So Carla, oh, sorry, I thought you had your hand up. Um, anybody sort of want to start thinking about that? When uh, can, should tax professionals um, play a role in this kind of disclosure? Walter? Um, I see that the big four, especially towards the outside world, publish their code of conduct very, very clearly and saying, if you see any misconduct, whether illegal or unethical, whether you see something suspicious, please report. But that is to the outside world that is keeping up appearances. Uh, I can tell you from the inside, uh, that's word of mouth. As soon as you report something, you are exited, you are guarded to the door, you cannot access your files anymore. Uh, yeah, and if the burden proof is on you, you and, and you're up against those big companies, you draw the shortest straw in many ways. So I'm fully with Samantha. Legislation is one thing. Yeah, and, and I see in Europe, the European Union has taken steps and countries are reluctant to adopt that into their local legislation, unfortunately, but I think the EU sample is working. But the problem is not just the legislation. The problem is how to adhere to that and how to see that it's followed up. Uh, yeah, because what, what do we want in future? That no one dares to raise their hand anymore if something is wrong, or do we prefer a world where maybe too many hands are there and maybe, yeah, 50% or 60%, thanks for the warning, but there was nothing there. Have it open in a transparent process uh, because the current current way it's working is not working. I can tell you from my personal experience. Thank you. Marie. Uh, thank you. Um... I mean, from from a whistleblowing perspective, uh, obviously, um, ta tax advisor. They, they. I mean, in many countries, they are they can report client misconducts um, under whistleblowing uh, under whistleblower protection laws. So, um, so that's one thing. For example, in the in in the in the European Union, that that's very much possible. And um, and I mean, they don't have to go through the public. I mean, it's an option, but you have to fulfill quite a few criteria to actually do that. But they can also just do like report internally to their to their company, or they can go to the authority, which in which case you don't have this issue of data protection that was mentioned earlier. So, so there are other other steps that can be taken. And I think from the from the sides of the company, what they can do is, and especially if they do not want to have all that data going outside. Uh, well, they have to actually implement those internal whistleblowing system that Samantha was um, talking about earlier, but not just because they have to, not just because they need to tick the box, but they actually want to make it work. Um, so that our people, their, their employees and people they work with go to them internally instead of going to the authority, which now in many countries they can go directly to. They don't have to go internally first. They can go directly to the authority. They will be protected and then the authority will follow up. So, I mean, that that's, I think, where, uh, where companies, tax advising companies uh, have a role to play um, like in that sense. Thank you. Um, Mary, then Carla. Yes, um, I think your question, Diane, is a good one, right? When can and should tax pro professionals play a role in the disclosure? Um, I think um, we've heard and, um, Marie did a great job just sort of talking about what's the importance of internal versus external. Um, I think one of the, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who spent 30 years representing whistleblowers, tax professionals play a really important role. It can be mystifying when you are inside typically a private um, major corporation and you are a tax professional and you've given your advice and you've been told that, no, that's not how we're gonna do it. And we're going to actually, 
oftentimes knowingly um, evade our responsibilities, um, that it can be very difficult to go internally because the very people <laughs> that you're supposed to talk to internally are the ones who um, are the architects of, of the fraud, who are looking at the bottom line and saying we can avoid a huge uh uh, hit on our next quarterly earnings statement if we can just, you know, retain these uh, these tax advantages. So one of the things that I think is really important is this question of how do we get external to governmental re regulators? That's one of the ways that's most protective to whistleblowers, because oftentimes you can get to those regulators confidentially. Um, and that's incredibly protective. And um, but it's from the point of view of the whistleblower, they don't often know where to go. Um, and they often don't have programs that protect them. So there are, and people are very well aware that both the IRS in the United States um, has a program where they've created an office of the whistleblower. And not only do they pay rewards, but they um, have talk about the protections that are in place against retaliation. And I think it's really important that programs like that exist because it's very easy to say, oh, I'm going to bring my information to the government regulator, where if the government regulator in Panama doesn't give a darn about you know compliance, they're capturing a lot of money uh, by facilitating this. So so it depends which government you're talking about and does that government actually have a dedicated arm of law enforcement and prosecutorial um, expertise who's actually willing to take that information and act on it. Um, so I don't think it's the right move for, for tax professionals to report in every jurisdiction. I think there's certain jurisdictions who's made it clear they will act on that information. And in the United States, it's not just the IRS, but there's certain states, including the state of New York, um, Illinois, a couple other states, the District of Columbia, Maryland, who actually also are welcoming whistleblowers to show and expose state and local tax fraud. So I do think there's a, it's probably one of the one places that I'll agree with Mr. Quarmby is that, yes, it's important for the government to act, but one of the best sources of information that the government has to act on this is inside information coming from tax professionals. So it's not an either or. It's not, oh, the OECD or, oh, the government should act. It's that what prompts the government to act is the roadmap to the fraud that these whistleblowers provide. Thank you. Uh, Carla, then Samantha. Thank you. To add to what Walter and uh, Mary just mentioned, as I represent ISPA, we set standards for professional accountants. And if you're a tax professional in one of the big four firms, you have to adopt our code. And per our code, we did say you have an ethical obligation to report unethical conduct of your clients you represent or even within the employing organization. And to, what, to add to what Mary mentioned is what we found the other side is there is a lack of protection for whistleblowers and the system in place to for them to identify who to go to. So it's not so much the profession that's lacking in ways of how they could disclose such instances is whether those involved in um, prosecuting such um, behavior are involved as part of the solution as well. Thank you. Uh, Samantha, then Philippa. Um, I think that the case of um, Bradley Birkenfeld is, is sort of interesting in illustrating uh, how you can make a lawful disclosure to an external authority and make a difference. Um, but, you know, in his case, uh, you see how a whistleblower, if they have unclean hands, it's especially risky for them. Um, but we still want to encourage them to bring the information that they have. And the case of uh, Birkenfeld, he was uh, a banker for the uh, USB, uh, Swiss bank. And uh, he discovered that uh, they had secret dealings uh, with American tax evaders uh, in violation of their written policies uh, and their agreement with the IRS. And so this led to uh, a US Swiss uh, tax treaty and numerous prosecutions. And he did win uh, $104 million uh, from the IRS as a whistleblower award. Um, and he had given his information to the IRS, the SEC, and the DOJ, and the US Senate. And the DOJ uh, had promised not to prosecute him uh, for his sort of unclean uh, hands, his involvement 
Um, and um, he they did actually change their minds and they did prosecute him for uh, fraud conspiracy uh, and they sentenced him to 40 months in prison. Um, and this was after he helped uh, save the treasury an estimated um, $100 billion a year um, to stop thousands of tax dodgers. So uh, it was really, again, not to keep making the same points, but of course, paramount that whistleblowers um, not only have legal protections in place, uh, but that they have access to legal uh, counsel and uh, also you know, consider the risks that they're taking um, if they're someone who has participated, because obviously whistleblowing you know, can't and shouldn't be used necessarily as, as a shield to to um, avoid accountability for one's own personal wrongdoing, but it certainly has a, a chilling effect uh, to be prosecuting uh, whistleblowers if that prosecutorial discretion uh, is available. Um, and so um, this was sort of an interesting case that uh, I think people have a lot of maybe different opinions on, but I just wanted to share that. Oh, indeed. Uh, so we have Philippa, Paul, and Eli in. Um, so I'm going to, at the end of that, kind of bring a next uh, related question, but it's all really unfolding. And, and honestly, everything we're talking about is quite connected. So Philippa, next. This is really quick. Thank you, Diane. Um, after, especially after uh, Carla and Mary spoke, I kept thinking about something when you were asking these questions. And that was, there are the standards to report, there are the issues that, you know, tax practitioners have to know, but really what tax practitioners need are skills known as like self-reflection, awareness, self-awareness of actually what they're doing. They need a curiosity and that desire to continuously learn and also a lot of self-awareness and resilience. And after listening to Samantha's, um, you know, talking about how a whistleblower could be punished, I think it demands a lot of strength. And that will all be talked about later this afternoon. But just to sort of get that idea that these are other skills that need to be taught or learned. Absolutely. Right. Um, and so I'm so glad you raised that now, Felipe, because it does. It's sort of what we're asking of people and expecting if we're thinking about what are taxpayer tax advisors in the gray area supposed to do? What is it we want? And, and, and there's not a single answer. We don't, I think, all uniformly agree. But as we're through today's session, thinking that through um, part of this and how are they going to be able to do that? What does it take? Not just legally, not just in terms of outside advice, not just in terms of governmental structures available to them for reporting, not just internal reporting structures, but what do they themselves need to be able to bring to the table um, as a sort of trained professionals? Um, all right, Paul, then Eli. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the internal versus external reporting. Um, I work with a lot of companies and their chief ethics and compliance officers. They spend a lot of money on helplines, speak up lines, open talk lines, and they really want to encourage people to report internally. I get that. And that's really, that should be the first choice. I think it's unfortunate though, that in the case of digital trust versus Summers, the Supreme court said in a nine to zero decision, in order to be defined as a whistleblower under Sarbanes-Oxley, you must report to the SEC. If you only report internally, you are not afforded any kind of uh, anti-retaliation protection or any kind of ability to get any kind of uh, uh, compensation for your salary. So uh, the fear, I think, is that if I do report internally, I think uh, Volter was talking about, you might be immediately exited from the building. And so you know, if I was giving advice, I might say, you know, ethically, you probably should try to report internally. But if you want the most legal protection under Sarbanes-Oxley, then you should go to the SEC and then have the information come back. Thank you. Eli. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of a lot has been mentioned about reporting to government authorities, which which obviously distinguishes itself a little bit from reporting to entities like uh, the media, for example. Um, but I just wanted to mention because there's there's also been some concerns raised between um, issues of privacy uh, versus our primary concern in the media, which is the public interest. Um, and I just wanted to mention, you know, that within the context of the media, or at least reputable media outlets, 
there is a very high bar um, for what constitutes public interest. Um, and so oftentimes, um, yeah, if we violate that, for example, we will have hell to pay just for starters, in addition to the whistleblowers that uh, come forth with this information. I was a little bit curious to understand a little bit about uh, what was said about uh, the Panama Papers whistleblower receiving a lot of money, because I, I, as a journalist, was very curious to understand where that claim was coming from. Uh, but just quickly, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, especially within the, the context of this gray area of taxation, it's a very uh, technical, specialized field. Um, and so oftentimes when I'm looking at documents and I'm trying to identify patent evasion or other uh, activities that may not fall, with it, fall within the realm of legality, we need to um, consult with people that have this technical skill. Uh, otherwise, we're effectively clueless. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not particularly specialized myself, and I think I speak for a lot of journalists in that respect. Um, but even activists and lawyers that have spent decades in the field, they can take a look at some transfer pricing document, and they won't necessarily know the methodology um, that will get you into this gray area or, you know, where the line is crossed into illegality. And I think that, um, you know, from the from a journalistic perspective, it's it's really important to consult with people that are within the industry. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary, to you, and then I'm going to bring our next question on. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to Eli's question about the his question about how do we know that the Panama Papers whistleblower did receive some money. Um, it's actually a it, it, this does I, I I comment on this because the issue of financial incentives as a way to encourage whistleblowers to undertake the significant risks of speaking up is something that is a very hot topic in Europe. It is not as favored as it certainly is in the United States. And even in Canada, there's a program called the Offshore Tax Informant Program. But what we know is that although Germany does not publicize that it um, has, a, has a habit or at least a pattern of sometimes paying whistleblowers. They do not publicize that they pay them, but they did in this instance pay a, some amount to the Panama Papers whistleblower, even though we don't know who he, she, or they are. They did do an interview with uh, the Sedeutsche Zeitung reporters um, anonymously, and he, he, she, they has a lawsuit basically saying that while the German government paid them something, they reneged on the full deal. Um, so I think it's really interesting to me that um, you know, Germ even Germany, which is one of, as Samantha can tell you <laughs> from the work on the EU whistleblowing directive, was slow to adopt the directive, is uh, not always very embracing of whistleblowers, see the wire card <laughs> scandal. Um, the fact that uh, their regulators and that their government actually does pay behind the scenes to me is remarkable. So what they say publicly about paying whistleblowers and what they do privately until they're exposed by the Panama Papers whistleblowers are two very different things. I think it could be a case study all to itself. And the last thing I will say is, Eli, you, you raise an issue that is a, a great passion of mine, which is that I think whistleblowers... Um, are in extremis when they get in these situations where they realize, wow, should I report internally, externally to the media? And I think one of the greatest services that we could do um, for whistleblowers is to have what I call sort of like a Mayo Clinic model, where if a whistleblower gets in the hands of the wrong attorney, the wrong journalist who doesn't understand what's at stake, you know, the consequences are dire for them. And wouldn't it be great if we could create an environment where whistleblowers could talk simultaneously to journalists and lawyers um, at, at the same time and, you know, corporate compliance experts to try and get that advice to have it all laid out um, because we're all so segmented. Um, but if we could all be in one room at the same time advising them, wouldn't we help get them to the best result? Thank you, Mary. Um, I just want to kind of uh, take one moment. There's a couple of other key questions I want to make sure we cover in this first session, but I did want to take a moment um, just to raise um, uh, a December 2022 uh, decision by the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union. And this was with respect to um, Directive uh, 
2011-16. And in it, the court ruled that the notification obligation on um, a lawyer intermediary, right, who has a legal professional privilege um, is not necessary, right? So this was the the directive was talking about uh, these professionals generally requiring professionals uh, to um, make sort of certain notifications regarding client conduct. Um, but a court a case was brought to the ECJ saying, uh, well, what about if that intermediary is a lawyer and they have professional privilege? Um, do they have to re- basically report uh, client misconduct, say uh, tax avoidance, tax evasion, uh, even though all other intermediaries will have to, uh, do the lawyers get a pass? And the court basically said, yeah, that's fine. It's okay if the lawyers uh, aren't required to do so. That's my brief summary. Uh, my question is your take on that, right? So that's the ECJ now sort of laying out the kind of European landscape on this question. Um, what do you think of that decision sort of uh, with respect to our lawyer intermediaries and their duties um, to report um, certain kinds of misconduct. Diane, yeah. can you say something, please? Uh, certainly. Okay, uh, if I remember properly about the sentence you were talking about, the court said that uh, it was not necessary for the lawyers to communicate the name of the client because the intermediary should know already the name of the client. So the point is try to defend some ways. It's not, it's not just try to defend the privacy of the client and of the lawyer. The point is if the information is already in the system, we don't need to double to double it. Uh, more, moreover, uh, is something um, I don't want. I don't think that nobody need to be defended, and nobody need to be accused. We are talking in a kind of scientific conversation. But the point is, what is really particular for me is to talk about gray area. Again, I don't want to defend nobody. I am not here to defend nobody. But the point is, what is gray? Uh, uh, before uh, I think was Ellie talking about the transfer pricing could be gray. Oh yeah, of course it could be. But the point is, it could not be white, it could not be black. The point is, the, those are the limit of the instrument we are using to uh, recognize which is the value. And the transfer price is a technical uh, instrument, is a tool invented one, one century ago for tax in the multinational since then. Um, uh, so the point is, if we concentrate on gray area, maybe uh, the point is we cannot uh, pretend we cannot pretend to tax everything. Then we will talk about the technology. Let's say today. Today, uh, maybe it could be said, but we should accept that some gray will exist uh, because it's more costly to found the gray, and maybe we could use those resources to find, I guess, what in Italy we call the black. The point is the two instruments, nowadays, I don't want to talk about the technology, we'll talk about the technology later, the two instruments nowadays that could be helpful to fight against the so-called gray are pillar one and pillar two. Pillar one, so the allocation of taxing rights within the country. And pillar one is a kind of um, rules, algorithm, uh, to uh, base on the, um, on, on the concept, on the notion that uh, the country of consumption need to uh, collect a certain amount of taxation. And the other, the other instrument to fight against the so-called rate is the global minimum tax, so-called pillar two. When all the company will pay the same amount of taxes worldwide, you there is no reason to have gray areas. But to me, 
as a tax advisor, but also as a citizen. The concept of grace is just confusing me. But this may, maybe it's just my personal opinion. Uh, no, I, I actually think you raised um, some really interesting points. I want to just quickly comment and also connected to uh, the prior uh, panel we had, uh, Gray Area 1. This is Gray Area 2. Uh, it is, I think, exactly that. It's a confusing space. And in the first session um, a couple of weeks ago that we did and is available online, I think we talked a little bit more about the ways in which law itself um, also regulation of the profession, law of the profession, uh, may limit the, the opportunities for gray, may reduce the space where it's ambiguous about conduct and what we think about it. Um, and, and I think that's interesting because it kind of, you know, here today, I think I see a little bit more thinking, all right, knowing that we're not, we're, we have not achieved that. We're, it's not as if the law has eliminated the gray space through the substantive provisions. Um, what do we think about uh, the tax advisor's role with respect to things like transparency and whistleblowing? Does that help us gain greater clarity as we understand what's happening inside taxpayers? Uh, to the extent taxpayers know they're going to be seen, do they engage in a bit more self-regulation of their conduct and shrink that gray space uh, because they think it's going to attract more attention? I think, I mean, it's a it's not, um, it's an area we struggle with and there's absolutely no agreement. When I do panels on this from a, sort of a uh, narrowly, I say narrow, ethics dimension, um, tremendous debate. Samantha, I wanna to turn to you next um, and then maybe move us on to some related questions that I think will fit with this. Um, so, you know, I just want to raise that the Enablers Act uh, in the US uh, it's something that the American Bar Association had had lobbied against, um, and uh, you know this would have required the legal profession uh, to uh, have certain requirements to to report, uh, you know, money laundering and um, and uh, similar you know, financial crimes, and. Um, I think that there was, you know, really strong adverse reaction to the the legal uh, requirements uh, and extending that to the legal profession. Uh, however, I, you know, I do think we have to think about the enablers of uh, corruption and financial crimes and their um, ability. Uh, at least as, as an option to report and making sure that they have channels and protections available to do so. Uh, it is not a best practice in whistleblower law to have any kind of mandatory or, or required reporting. And I think the same should be true for uh, accountants and, and anyone else. Uh, because as, as I think we've already shown, whistleblowers who come forward really do so at their own peril. We cannot rely on those rights actually to protect them. We don't want to lead the, la the lambs to the lion's den. Um, and so, you know, I'm against required reporting, but I do think that there is, is more to be done to navigate some of these areas uh, better in the legal profession and in, in the way that the uh, accountants uh, profession already has international standards that help people to um, uh, report or navigate the laws and encourage them to seek counsel, um, but have you know reporting in the public interest um, and even externally in in, in uh, more severe circumstances, uh, limited but severe circumstances, and that's something that I think needs to be available both in the United States um, and worldwide if we're really going to tackle this problem. Thank you, Sudesh. Yeah. Uh Maybe uh, just to uh, circle back on the question of legal professional privilege and um, just to come back to the basic philosophy that it exists for for the fundamental that the fair trial exists, the, the client gets the privilege and the, he can communicate freely with the with his attorney. So that's the fundamental principle that the fair justice happens. And to and and this decision about what Diane, what you mentioned about this European decision of uh, whether uh, the lawyer intermediary should report to uh, report or not, and the court said no because of it's the European human rights. This uh, in Europe you have this uh, human right convention, and it is protected under that. 
So basically the challenge is within the law, you cannot do anything because law says it's a human right, it's a fundamental principle, and that information is is protected. Uh, the the lawyer uh, is that the information is has a uh, the client attorney privilege. So one of the ways I think of striking a balance, which I see, is there are a few examples. One example is in is in, in if you take, look at in case of France, what is France is doing is, it's a, a lawyer doesn't in if a lawyer finds such information, he doesn't have to report directly to the government. What is the, they have made a middleman. Who is the middleman? Middleman is the bar association, the president of the bar association. So if lawyer comes across such information, what he does is he sends that information to president of the bar association. And then president of the bar association may decide that they may want to pass on such information to the intelligence, the FIU of France or not. So this is perhaps one example I came, uh, I think could be a way of balancing the legal professional privilege versus the versus its misuse and 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 one example just to just to just to close this is uh, in in australia what they have started is they have they have drafted a a protocol of legal professional privilege it's of course it's voluntary you don't ha uh, have to compulsorily uh, abide by it but when they made this protocol the ato they brought in the government they brought in the big four they brought in the civil society and different organizations they brought in and then they made a a protocol it's a voluntary code of conduct if a lawyer is advising his client it is presumed that he is abiding by this voluntary code of conduct there's something giving to the society and this is something maybe perhaps a good way of of balancing uh, legal privilege versus its its misuse but again it's client attorney privilege it's 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 a it's a difficult topic and it's a difficult topic to handle yeah. thank you uh Walter <clears throat> yeah, I I have to say that uh, I tend to disagree with the previous speaker, and uh, politely so. Uh, I think the uh, and I've worked with uh, legal privilege in my case, uh, where where a investigator pretended to have a neutral investigation of my report uh, turned out to be uh, the representation of the counterparty. Uh, in this case, the big four. Uh, but didn't disclose themselves in that role and therefore were a, uh, a party to it. Second, uh, I believe uh, that governance is a very important theme in this and that any governing authority, whether it's the Bar Association or the Accountants Association, uh, that they should be fully transparent. And what I see a lot is that it varies country by country and that a lot of the uh, supervision uh, is is done behind closed doors, but also they have an incentive to keep their own profession to the outside world as clean as possible. I think the major problem here is in the monetary incentives that are allowed. Uh, yeah, I think if you incentivize whistleblowers too much, and maybe this is a European view that will uh, start false uh, filing uh, and it will create false incentives, uh, incentives. Uh, at the same time, the incentives for people retaliating on, uh, on whistleblowers are also financially very clear. So I'm more of a, a, a proponent of saying we need to create a, 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 a safety net or a level playing field within that game. Yeah, and I think the only way to get that done is via an NGO because as Mary uh, said, you know, also the people that provide money to the whistleblowers are people that have an incentive. Yeah, the SEC, uh, various states in the US, et cetera, et cetera. So if we uh, try to rise above that and create transparency and a view and a safety net, I think the world will be a slightly better place. Still not perfect, but uh, my point of view. Thank you. And Marie, uh... I'll, I'll go to you and then have one last question I'm going to ask. Uh, thank you, Diane. I think like this, this issue of, of legal privilege is a very important and crucial one because uh, taking this the example of the EU directive and so that's unlike most EU countries and many other countries actually um, and like 
per, like people who report uh, legal privilege information would not be covered by the whistleblower protection laws. So that's some of the things that are excluded from the scope of the law. So, so that's very tricky. And then it leads to the question of what should be covered by legal privilege, because as was expressed before, it's very important. It's a very important concept and it needs, you know, it's, it needs to be kept. But then uh, we have the impression that more and more things are falling under that. Um, and so, so if you have, for example, a tax advisor who's not a lawyer, um, like working on a situation, on a case which would be exactly the same as a lawyer might work on, like this tax advisor can report the issue and be protected as a whistleblower, but the lawyer who's been working on the same issue cannot. So, I mean, that's, I think there are like things to be reflected on that, and it's maybe a distortion of the, of the concept. Um, same thing we, we might have seen also with data protection, it became like more and more and more like bigger and bigger and bigger with the GDPR and other and other data protection laws coming up. So maybe maybe to reflect on that. Thank you very much. Um, the last question I just wanted to, to put before you all um, for this session is thinking a bit about beneficial owner registries. And that kind of came up at the beginning a little bit, but I want to want to come back to that now and and really kind of maybe ask two uh, different questions uh, about the beneficial owner registries. Um, the first is the um, importance or not of uh, public accessibility, and one could even imagine public accessibility as a, an accordion of degrees of public. Um, so your thoughts on that. Also noting that the um, uh, European Court in their Grand Chamber decision in November 2022 um, uh, 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 invalidated a provision of the anti-money laundering directive that had mandated states uh, make the beneficial owner registry uh, accessible to the general public. Um, so curious about your thoughts on that and public access generally. Uh, and then the second question related to beneficial owner registries gets back into the role of tax professionals per se. Um, what is the role of the tax professional? in ensuring the accuracy and the integrity of the information that's provided, even if it just goes to the government? Um, and what kind of duty do they have to uh, inform the registry if they think it's not correct and it won't end the, the, you know, the taxpayer, so to speak, uh, isn't willing to do so? Um, so thoughts on either of those questions? Diane, if I may. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um... Uh, let me say something about, first of all, uh, the beneficial owner register. Uh, let's take into consideration that uh, in consider country like Italy, for instance, we had during years and years ago, finally not now, uh, uh, kidnapping. So the point is, I completely agree that all the inquiring authorities, tax authority, um, the judges, they, uh, the banks, they have access to the register, but let's take into consideration also the risks um, in terms of uh, social consequences of, uh, of this information. Uh, also, in terms of information I don't want to give to my competitors. So, uh, I mean, um, uh, let me go back for a while. I don't want to say that I, I completely agree with the register of beneficial owners. To totally agree. Uh, but the point is, uh, mm, as a tax advisor, uh, mm, my aim is also to... Um, try to vehiculate this kind of culture to the clients. And you know, I think that all my colleagues, they know here that the clients just, they want to hear just the things they want to hear. So the point is, first of all, is a kind of cultural problem. Uh, uh, I started to work when the first directive of anti money laundering was introduced, adopted. And I remember at that time I was working in a bank and for people working in a bank after 20 years was completely insane, the idea to communicate those transactions. So, but nowadays, um, I was responsible for money laundering in a trustee company in Italy. And I tell you, maybe I was lucky, um, I'm no more now, but I tell you, there was a, 
a certain uh, uh, um, a certain attention on the uh, anti-money laundering issues. Not just, uh, let me say, and, and then I go back to the point, not just in terms of value, because you can agree or not agree. I mean, I, it's a question of uh, also cultural. Um, but the point is, what is important are the penal penalties and what is important, most important for companies, for banks, for instance, is the reputation. So uh, let's go back. Um, uh, let me say, uh, if I can talk about uh, um, the privilege and DAC6 and uh, uh, the directive uh, uh, regarding the tax loopholes, uh, consider three instances uh, the Italian paradox. Um, when an intermediary has got to fill, has got to send uh, the transaction to the tax authority, uh, the tax authority uh, from the uh, software gives you a number, a code. And the point is you have got to communicate this code to the client and the client has got to fill this code on, on his tax form. But the point is that consider that what happens is that maybe you are doing the, you communicate, the, your communica the communication that you do for the mandatory, mandatory disclosure uh, aim is the same that you are doing for money laundering. And the, the communication for money laundering has got to be anonymous. So the point is, we still have, at the present moment, there are many new rules, but on my personal opinion, not even the national legislator give the, the, the proper importance to each of them. And so this is not a technical issue, and this is not um, something that uh, regards the values, but this is something regarding the culture, not just for the client, but also even uh, the, the government. So I think that at least is maybe we just need times, but what I can, I, what I want to underline that nowadays with all the instrument that has been approved at the OECD level or at the EU level, we are not in the same position, in the same situation we were living, let's say, in 2015, 2016. So if, if we consider this from the historical perspective, we should be happy. There is still a lot of work to do in terms of value, in terms of culture. Thank you. Uh, Eli, then Marie, then Sadesh. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify before I like disclaimer before I make this point that I'm not an activist, I'm a journalist. But as a journalist, I will tell you that the fact that this legislation was struck down has made my job and my colleagues' job uh, infinitely more impossible. Um, and I would like to remind uh, just everybody that, um, again, as I said before, we have strong, strong commitments to the public interest. And so if we are looking at a series of uh, beneficial ownership um, data, so individuals, beneficial owners that are associated with companies, if there's no story that is in the public interest, we don't report it. Uh, but on the other hand, we found many instances where we are able to trace uh, problematic companies, problematic financial flows to individuals, um, and that's how the public uh, can be more aware of uh, very egregious acts of corporate um, and individual crime. Um, and I think that, you know, again, I'm not an activist, but as a journalist, I have certain issues with say, only keeping that within the realm of uh, law enforcement because there are certain investigations that are by nature cross-border, um, you know, that fall outside of the realm of certain jurisdictions. And so it's very important and I understand your concerns about certain privacy concerns, for example, um, you know, extortion and kidnapping. But again, I, I think that might be a little bit of a straw man argument in some respects, because oftentimes, um, well, I mean, just just to, to finish up, I, I think that, you know, from our position, if you don't have anything to hide, um, you know, you don't really you shouldn't really necessarily have anything to worry about in with the exception of some very. Uh, extreme uh, outlier cases. Um, 
The other thing that I wanted to mention, I just wanted to call uh, attention to an investigation that uh, my colleagues uh, did. It's uh, very interesting about a key architect of the person that, uh, you know, he was, he was a, of a major law firm and he was a key architect in striking down this legislation and he himself works within the industry. So there is this clear conflict of interest, um, you know, in that respect too, I can pass the link on in the chat if, if you're all curious to read this, but I think it's quite fascinating. Uh, he represented a lot of, uh, you know, individuals who had hidden large amounts of uh, real estate uh, there. I think it was a lot of Russian businessmen, someone that worked for Gazprom, et cetera. So I, I think that that would be something that might interest you as well. Just, uh, just wanted to point that out. Ellie. If I may say, I totally agree with you. I think that your work is fundamental because without your work, there would not be the reputation would would not be an issue. I think that uh, I go back. We maybe we just need the time to fine tune the new laws because um, I, I totally understand what you say, and I hope that you also understand what I said in terms of what could happen. Maybe just maybe the problem is just uh, narrowed here in Italy because we went through this kind of experience. Uh, I think it's just a question of time to find the uh, right balance within within the, the two the, the two needs. Let me say, uh, and then if we go back to technology, I think that technology some way somehow could help us in this way. Thank you. Um, before I give it to Marie and then Sadesh, I just wanted to say, you know, I find it interesting as I listen to this, it's really, uh, I think one way of understanding uh, the struggle you're both facing and trying to work this through is sort of how do we think about and, and judge the value of this kind of information to the public in a democracy? Um, and it's, again, not on off, but how how are our answers to that question uh, really furthering the the sort of ultimate values and functioning um, of a democracy? Um, Marie and then Sidesh. Uh, yeah, thank you, Diane. I mean, I think I think I just wanted to highlight that I mean, beneficial ownership transparency, for example, it's it's a way to uh, to provide a structured way to access information so by the authority, obviously, but also civil society and the members of the public. And that's how we don't need to rely on those so-called leaks and whistleblowers and put all the weights on their shoulders and take all that they will be the one taking all the risk. And that's something that needs to be addressed. And uh, and I mean, there have been a like, recent example where like beneficial ownership registers, uh, uh, like the public access as you know, allowed to identify some wrongdoing and some and some risk, like for example, the the, the open lux the open lux investigations, and and linked to that, uh, relating to to ensuring the accuracy and integrity of of the information um, in those register. I mean, of course, um, the the, prof the tax professional should have a role in ensuring that, but but that's not enough, and it's also important that the authority do active checks. On the, on the quality and the veracity of the data and um, and also have like sanction when it's not the case. And I think that's also quite crucial in this instance. Thank you, uh, Sadesh. Yeah, just three quick points. One, uh, the first point is um, when, uh, when Europe says the public register on beneficial ownership should not be allowed, uh, it just doesn't have the implications for Europe. There are other continent, Africa, or, or other, other other countries which which who are following the lead of the Europe, if they, they say that if Europe is not allowing the opening the beneficial ownership register, perhaps we also follow it. So this is one impact of what is happening in the Europe. It may happen in the on the other continents also. Second is when uh, perhaps uh, it has also been touched by um, other uh, Daniel or 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 or, or Ellie is um, perhaps the context or cultural factors in Europe may be different. But if you look, if you put the same thing in, in Africa or, or other countries in Latin America, if you open the public beneficial ownership registers, it's like kidnapping and those things are, so you need to be really careful. It's, you can't take the step of putting the information on the wrong people's hand. You could get kidnapped on the next day. So you also need to be think about these cultural factors. And the third issue is how do we balance it? When on the one side we have says this human right, fundamental rights of privacy, confidentiality. How do we uh, solve this issue? 
I think one way I see this issue can be solved is by, I, I think, use of technology encryption and and making it available to only the people who have need to have access to. So I think I, I understand this viewpoint of we should not make it public, but it can be done with the help of technology that that information could be made available to the people like journalists or academics or government officials. But we need to be really careful of who which person has access to such information. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. So um, before we take our short break, I just wanted to note that we've been getting some um, really interesting sort of comments back and forth um, in the uh, the Q&A. So I want to thank the audience for doing that, trying to sort of incorporate this. Um, and uh, fantastic. So uh, we're about to take a five minute break. I just wanted to give you a heads up on the timetable going forward. We've actually touched upon a number of issues that are emerging in the next session. So I may adjust the time a little bit there to keep us overall on time uh, because we've really, you know, once you start talking, you just hit all, I mean, they're all interconnected and you've done a great job of already anticipating a number of the things we'll be looking at. So to that, uh, it's, a, uh, it's quarter of uh, by my clock, uh, wherever you are, hopefully. Um, so we're going to take a five minute break and come back just be uh, 10 before the hour. So thank you. <laughs> 